Um, yeah, perfect. All good. Okay, thank you very much, Swapnil. Um, for those who don't know, why is my sorry? So as Swapnil said, this is this is a um, a two-parter. So I really originally, I, in fact, the motivation for doing this is to present open AI, speci open API specifications, uh, which are an important part of the documentation landscape these days. Um, but sort of the prerequisite is showing you how to do, set up a publishing platform so you can actually. Uh, publish them to a wider audience. So I wanted to start off with uh, showing you that publication platform. And I've picked Hugo as the example. I'll explain why later. Uh, and we're just, just going to go through how you set up a Hugo website and publish it on um, a public cloud infrastructure system. Um, and then next month, I'll talk about the open API, open API specification. I'll be focusing on how to use it and how to publish it rather than details of how it works, uh, because that's quite a large topic. and could probably occupy a two-day workshop. Um, so those of you who not met me before, um, I work at uh, Papercut as a developer advocate. So I'm helping, rather than being a document, documentation specialist, I'm helping our development partners um, use our APIs and such like things. Uh, and a part, major part of that, of course, is, is documentation, but I, I really come from a consulting background. Um, you can find me on quite a few of the usual places. So if you want to reach out after this talk, uh, feel, feel free with any questions. Um, and let's get straight into it. So hopefully most people here are familiar with Docs as code, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. But the general idea is, is that you take the pro tools and processes that your development team are using. So I'm specifically talking here in a software development context, of course, not so much a hardware product context, but it's, there are some of the things still apply. Um, and you involve the whole of the, the development team in actually helping you to create content. Okay. And the reason we're doing that is that if you start using agile tools and agile processes, you can respond to change faster. And if you can get the whole of the development, the whole of the development team involved in creating content, um, then you can hopefully scale up and, and do more with less as it were. So that's, that's been the motivation. In order to make Docs's code work for you, you need to make a few changes to what might be a traditional uh, documentation workflow. So you need to throw out Microsoft Word and, and Flare and all those sort of proprietary type tools uh, and bring in um, a plain text documentation format with some lightweight markups. So things like ASCII doc, um, restructured text, or what we're gonna to see today is Markdown. Um, you need to sort of embrace uh, a more agile developer focused set of processes. So things like raising issues through tickets, uh, triaging issues from, from customers with documentation, using version control, which we'll look at, uh, doing reviews, unit testing, all those sort of things to get your changes through quicker and faster. Um, you can depend quite heavily on tools and, and automation frameworks. Um, so um, I have examples, which I won't go into today, about how you can generate content automatically, check, do a lot of the checking of your, um, of your content to make sure, for instance, that you don't have uh, inappropriate language or there's a sp spelling text or that links don't work and that sort of thing. Um, we're going to be doing some automation today and we're going to be using a CI-CD engine, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and you want, and this is what we're going to focus on today, a rapid low ceremony way or an easy way of getting content from your, your repository of, of, of stuff, your documents, images, that sort of thing, out into a public or, or private uh, publication platform like a static website, so web pages. Um, if you don't have uh, the ability to deploy to a website, you can use wikis, and I've done that quite a lot but web, web pages are better, they're richer. I did briefly just now about CICD, which is continuous integration and continuous delivery. Put simply, it's, um, it's a platform that monitors your environment. And when some event happens, usually when, it, when you check in some new content or check in some new changes, then it, then it will do things for you. Uh, and the examples we see here, it's quite simplistic. It's actually going to just publish our content uh, but you can do much more complicated activities. Uh, you can reformat documentation. You can go through these various linting or spell checking tools I was talking about. You can create images. You can do all sorts of things. Uh, but the whole point is it happens with you have, without you having to actually do anything 
beyond what you do in your normal workflow. It's the workflow events that you, you perform that then kick off these activities for you on your behalf. Um, there's some more information here. Um, I actually did a talk, quite a detailed talk on, on Docs's code previously, and I've got a link in there. Uh, and this video uh, from Jen Lamborn, which she wrote, did, did it uh, write the Docs UK a few years ago, talks about how a large ponderous organization like the UK government actually adopted Docs's code to improve their agility. So that's quite interesting talk, I, I recommend it. Okay, let's talk a bit about static websites and how they're different from, from what you may be used to. So static versus dynamic websites. So on the left, we've got an example, which is eBay, and that is very much a dynamic website. So if you, if you go to eBay and open up a page like this, it will show you a catalog of products and prices. And if you're a different part of the world, it might show you a different set of products and prices, or if you refresh the page in another two minutes, you might have a different set of products and prices because it's very rapidly changing content, uh, it's geogra geographically specific and so on and so forth. And so that content doesn't actually exist as a, as a, as a page at eBay. It's, it's, a, it's a set of information records in a database. And when, you, when, when your browser hits the eBay website, that, that page is dynamically built and all the content is, is added to it at the time you request it. And then it's published to your browser. On the right, we've actually got the Papercut website, uh, not because I want to uh, spruik Papercut, but because that is actually Hugo website. So that's a static website. So we don't push changes to that website more than a few times a week, uh, along with, I guess, most corporate websites. So having, having going through this laborious process of dynamically building pages every time someone requests is not that efficient. It's better if we pre-build the pages when we deploy the website, and then every time um, a user goes to that website, they get exactly the same page um, and it's all pre-built. And that means that it's at the time of delivery, it's a simple process of delivering that single web page plus any associated content. We don't have to actually build the web page. Um, and that leads to obviously much faster content delivery. The infrastructure is simple. We don't have to have a, we don't have to have a content management system which can be quite large and, and ponderous to do. We just need a simple web server. Um, now, this means that every user gets the same page every time, but you can mitigate that. In fact, we do A-B testing on our website because we have a front end in front of the Hugo server that is actually providing the, the different web pages. But, but you know, without that infrastructure, every user gets the same page no matter where they are. Um, and it's not until we actually update the website with a new deployment that the, the content changes. Um, on a dynamic side, of course, it's the opposite. Dynamic websites are able to produce wonderful content, which, which is very dynamic, but it needs complex infrastructure and it can be uh, resource intensive and slow or slower. So how do you use a static site website generator? So on the left, we've got a documentarian um, who is developing content and hopefully it's part of an army of people developing content. And at some point that content will be pushed into a version control repository. Um, and from there, the static site generator can get all the content out, goes through a batch process, so as you've used that terminology, but goes through a, a process that, that builds all of the content, all the pages, all the HTML files, that are required for that website. And then that content can be delivered to a web server. So it's a set of files that are just copied to a web server. And every time the reader then asks the web server for a page, that those, those individual pages can be served. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be, so, so the big difference is, is that there's a static site generation process going on that might happen once or twice a day only, or once, you know, even once or twice a week, doesn't if, depending on when the content gets updated. Um, and that is what gets triggered by changes being, being pushed into production. Um, and that then creates a set of flat files. It doesn't create entries in a database. And those flat files are then copied to a web server so that the web server can serve the content. Why did I choose Hugo? Uh, Hugo is fast, it's quite popular. Um, 
as I say, it's uh, it's a real life large scale environment because the paper cut website is Hugo based. Uh, and actually, the reason I chose Hugo is because I want to be I want when I was doing my own production environment for our developer portal, I wanted to be compatible with the um, with our main website so that uh, our web development team can take over the developer portal if needed. So therefore, that's what Hugo was chosen personally for that reason. Hugo is extremely powerful and flexible. That means it can be difficult and hard to learn. And that's certainly the, the, what I found when I first started. So I'm hoping today means that you can avoid some of the early pain. Uh, there are lots of other website generators, not just Hugo. Um, I personally quite like Sphinx for documentation. If you don't have um, a bigger need for Hugo, then look at Sphinx. Uh, it has lots of documentation specific features, which are quite handy built in. I just want to quickly clear up some possible uh, terminology confusion, and that's around dynamic websites and dynamic web pages. So a dynamic website is a website where each individual web page is built on the server at, at the time of request and delivered to the browser. A dynamic web page is a web page that can be built, can be pre-built like a static website, but it contains dynamic content, usually through well, not usually, but delivered through features like CSS and JavaScript. And so the, the user in the browser gets a very dynamic experience. All that processing happens in the browser, but it's static. It's just delivering files of HTML, files of CSS, and files of JavaScript to the browser for the browser to then deliver. And that stuff can be delivered from a static site generator. So static site generators can still deliver dynamic web pages. Okay, let's actually, well, before I, before I jump in, are there any, any, sorry, my headphones are speaking at me. So, so any, I don't see any quick questions in the chat, so I'm gonna assume everybody's happy and I can carry on. Yeah, okay. So that, that was kind of the theoretical, the theoretical uh, explanation. We're now actually going to go through and have a real example. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present you um, an example from setting up Hugo, generating some content, um, going through a, a, a review loop. And that's gonna be the first part of the demonstration. That's what's happening in this square box, my local workstation. And then we're gonna see how we can actually build or use an existing cloud service from GitLab um, and set up a build deployment process so that whenever we push changes into the cloud, we automatically generate a new website. And that's part of this automation workflow I was talking about. So two parts, yep. Uh, so let's kick off on the first one. So what we're going to see is how to install Hugo, creating a Hugo project, and doing all the things you need to do to get the Hugo environment set up. And then finally, we're going to create some content and pre preview those results and, and be able to make changes to the content and see those changes on our desktop. So I'm going to jump over here. Are my fonts big enough? If anybody can't see those fonts, let me know and I'll make them bigger. Are we happy? Not seeing any typing messages. Okay. So typically, typically um, when you're doing these types of activities using the command line. So this is obviously for some people not something they're used to. Um, I'm going to be showing you each of the commands I'm typing and explaining them as we're going along. But don't worry about taking notes because if you go to here, and I put a link to this in the slides, I completely document everything I'm doing. So here, there's a complete run through here of all the commands I'm typing and some bit more detail in the notes about why I'm doing that. So, and I will post this link also in the meetup group. So don't worry about taking notes or, or getting getting lost. Just, just listen to my soothing voice. Hey Alec, um, just a comment about, can you make it this a little bit bigger maybe? If you can oh, zoom in. Uh, that's, it's about, wait, is that big enough, bit, bit further? Um, it looks good to me, Priyanka. Yeah, yeah, all good. All good okay. Now. okay. So the first thing you need to do is install Hugo. I've already done that. And there's actually a link there uh, so that you can install it yourself. You can install it in a variety of ways. 
and since you're using either Macs or Windows or that, I didn't want to get bogged down. So just follow the installation instructions. So having got the product installed in your local workstation, um, you'll want to create a Hugo project. So you go to a command prompt and you just type Hugo new site and then the name of your new site. And that will come back to you and it'll say, well, I've, I've created this new site for you in your demo docs project directory. So I created that for you. And it tells you something you're to do, which we're going to do, which we're going to, we're going to install a theme, add some content, and then we're going to use the Hugo server to preview that content. Um, it also gives you a link for more information. Um, however, uh, and this is one of the things I, I found quite confusing, is that a lot of the documentation seems to assume that you want to create a blog website, which doesn't work at all well for documentation. And I spent an awful lot of time sort of trying to adapt or, or understand how to create a documentation website. So hopefully that'll, this will save you that, um, that problem. So if we just quickly type a command called tree, it actually displays in a nice format all the different directories that were created. It also created a configuration file, it created a default archetypes file. I'm not going to talk about those. Um, now, I should have prefaced all this by saying that um, you know, because of time, I can't take you into all the powerful features of Hugo. It does have lots of powerful features like uh, dynamic templates with code um, uh, and, and archetypes, uh, taxonomies, that sort of thing. We, we're not going to be able to touch on most of that. Uh, this is just a simple in getting your first website up and running. So a lot of this stuff I'm going to just ignore. Um, but to actually do any work, let's just change directory into this demo project. And then if you remember previously, it said step one, install a theme. So you need to go to this website here. Um, so if I click on here, it's gone to the it's gone to the Hugo Themes website. I'm actually looking at the things that are tagged documentation. So I can browse through these themes and look at them and see which one I want to use. Uh, I actually have to like this Geek Doc one. It's responsive. It does what I want. So I've, I've used that. And then you'll want to, you know, you want to look at the documentation and kind of see some examples, try it out. Go to the home, you want to go to the home page. This is the home page now for this specific theme. And look at the getting starting guide here. Um, so I'm going to do download a pre-release. So this is how I install this theme. And we're not going to go through the details. We're just going to basically use this command as is. Um, and I'm just going to do that. So let's follow the install procedure. So again, we're just copying this pretty much as is. I have made some sort of little changes for my own, my own uh, site, but that's fine. And it takes a few seconds, but it actually installed a bunch of files. So let's have a look at those files. So if you remember before, if I scrolled up to here, this themes directory was empty. But now this themes directory has got a Hugo Geek Doc directory in it, which has got a whole bunch of files. I'm not showing all of them. And you can install as many of these themes as you want. You, they just all sit in their own directory under themes. Um, and you can just change the configuration to point to the right one. So you can, you can play with multiple themes, it's not a problem. So now in order to use that theme, we have to link that directory into our Hugo website. We do that by editing our config.toml file. And up comes our favorite, or well, my favorite, my favorite editor. Which is taking a long time for some reason. It's demo mode, so something always goes wrong. Here we are. So what we've done is that we set up this config.toml file with pointing to the correct theme. So if you want to change themes, you just change that setting and it'll pick up a different theme. Um, I've also given myself a nice title uh, because I'm in Australia, I've made it English Australian. Uh, setting this base URL is the appropriate value for a test development environment. And we'll come back to that uh, towards the end when we... We come back to that when we, we when we deploy live. I've also cut and pasted the suggested configuration from the Geek Doc 
uh, theme documentation. We just you don't have to think about it, just paste it straight in. And that is our environment setup. So if I close that, and that is now a working Hugo environment. So to do three things, basically, start the project off, install a theme, and configure the theme for use uh, through the config.com file. So let's add some content. So the first thing you do is you type a command into Hugo saying a Hugo new, and you don't give it a site, you give it a name, and it knows it's a page. So I said, I want, I want an index.html page. And the Hugo convention is that you call it a .md file because it's going to be marked down, not HTML. And you put an underscore in front of it uh, to give it some magic semantics. Ah. Oh. We won't worry about that. That's something that's come up. Uh, I'll explain why later. That's a new thing. Let's edit. So let's see what it's done is it's now just added a new index file into the content directory. So all our content is the content directory. I don't have to actually edit that file. It should be much faster this time. I'm not going to shut down my editor anymore because it's too slow to start up. So when I said new index, it didn't actually give me a completely empty file. It gave me what's called front matter. And this is quite this stuff is quite important. And all of your content directories um, need to have this front matter on. So if you're copying a markdown file from another project or an, you know, another platform, you need to make sure that you insert this front matter at the front. Um, notice that draft is set to true. So initially by default, uh, post, you know, documents are draft and they won't get published to production. I'm gonna give it a title. And we're going to put some rubbish content in there, and it's deliberately rubbish content. So I'm going to go back and improve that in a minute. So save that away. And now I've actually got some content. I want to preview that content and do something with it. So that's a two-stage process. It's a static site generator. That's actually a two-stage process, remember, from the, the first picture I showed you. And that's you've got to generate the website static files, and then you have to make those web files available through a, through a browser sorry, through a web server. Um, so normally it's a two-stage process, but Hugo allows you to do it all in one step uh, because it's got this server option on it. Uh, and so this is how you pre preview, preview things um, on your development system. Um, so I'm giving it the server option, so it starts a web server for me. This minus capital D is important. If you remember, um, I set draft to true here. Uh, so if you don't, by default, that means it won't be published unless you put this minus D. So this minus D is saying publish the drafts. This disable fast render means that when I'm viewing the page, it'll refresh for me when any changes come through. And this bind minus minus zero means that I could actually display this content on my phone. And I will be able to preview, because this is a responsive theme, I'll be able to preview the content on my phone because it's, it's exposed to the outside world and minus V means for both. So if I just hit enter, it's gone through and it's generated five. I only created one web page, it was actually created five. Um, and it's serving this on localhost 1313. So actually let's have a look and see what that looks like. So that's that was uh, that came from my configuration file. This came from the the index.html. I, I say, um, and you'll notice that this has got a, a fancy uh, theming. I can change I can change the the mode from dark to light and so on. And it's got some garbage in here. So I'm actually seeing the site that I created. And now now I'm sort of developing content. I'd actually like to to fix some of these documentation problems. I'll have to put a level two heading. Some, some words that actually make sense. Uh, 
and exclamation marks. If I save that straight away, it immediately refreshes. So I've got a very tight create con or change content, review content workflow here, and I can just see how exactly how it's going to look on, on the Hugo website. Now, I did say that the way that uh, static websites work is that they write all this content onto a file system so they can be picked up by the web server. Uh, I'm just going to stop Hugo a minute. Um, do that over here because I don't want to interrupt my demo script. But there's actually, when we actually look at the system now, because I'm using the serve option, there's no actual content being written. And that's because I'm in this in this development mode. So content is served from memory, not from files on a web page. So we can actually use the minus D option to force the generation of content or just skip the server option. So I'm going to actually have Hugo run now and generate the content to a public directory for me. So if I just hit enter, uh, it's this time it's still minus D to um, to generate the draft, to, to include the draft content, but I haven't put any other options because I've actually just wanted to write stuff. And it's write it, written it, sorry, not write it, it's written it into the public directory. Okay, so if I then look at this public directory, here are all the files you expect to find in the website. So there's 404, uh, there's some XML stuff, there's some custom CSS files, there's my index.html file, which is generated from my markdown, and so on. But that's just written some files. It doesn't give me a web server on which I can see it. So what I'm going to do now is, and we can cross over the details, I'm going to bring up an Nginx server, and I'm going to make available this public directory to the Nginx server so it can serve the files for me. And I could have used any web server, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I'm going to use Docker for that, but again, it doesn't matter. The important thing to notice is that I'm passing in this public directory to which the content was written into the Nginx HTML directory. So I'm effectively copying the files into the web server um, environment. And now, if the demo gods are with me, if I go to localhost, 8080, because that's the port I'm exposed on. It should show me the same content, and there it is. So this content is now being served through a different web server. It's being served through Nginx, but the effect is identical. It's all static content. And there's all the output from Nginx saying it's serving all these things. So let me just stop that. Uh, So we now have a working, basic working Hugo environment. We've got a web, we've got an actual site project set up. We've configured it and we've added content. So we're in a good place. Right, now let's go one stage further. We want to deploy our content to a, web, to, um, a, a cloud server so that anybody can watch it. So we're going to, we've got to store our stuff in the cloud. We need to have control of, us, of, of our content. So the, ways, the reasonable way to do that is with a version control tool. Uh, and we're going to use Git, uh, which is probably the world's most popular, in fact, undoubtedly the world's most popular version control tool. So again, if you're not familiar with Git, don't worry too much about this. Just accept it as is. So I can just do Git init to initialize a new source code repository, or in this case, documentation repository. And I've actually got some content that I had previously prepared. So I'm just going to copy the content files over. And what I've done is I'm actually just going to preview that. So if we go back to our previous website, which was on the, on the Hugo uh, local server and hit refresh, we've now got the new content. We've got a couple of different pages. Um, we've even got a nice pretty picture. This picture was generated using what's called mermaid. So I just typed in this text, this magic text, and it generated a nice picture for me. Um, and I've got references here to page bundles, and that'll become apparent why in a minute. So if I just stop this demo, 
show you the new files that I put in the content tree. So I just copied files into the content tree. And this reflects the structure of my websites. This is kind of hinting towards taxonomy management. These are called page bundles. Each page bundle has got an index.md file in it. Um, they can have other things like images and stuff like that. But this is the content that makes up the structure of my website. I've also changed all the front matter. So if you look at the front matter now, um, I've changed the draft to false. So this means that when I run Hugo, it will pick up without the minus D option, it will now pick up these, these, these content files as being suitable for public for publication. I've also added the weight to this. And the reason for having that weight is so that this navigation menu is, is not created in alphabetical order. Yeah. So G comes after C in the alphabet, but by adding the correct weight values into there, I can I can shift that order around. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. We actually now need to add some specific configuration to Git, so that Git will ignore things that we don't want to add, that we don't need to build our website. Uh, and the things we don't need are themes and any previously generated public content because we're going to regenerate the content on the cloud. So we just create this file called git ignore and we add themes and public to that. And now we've got we've got enough to actually commit all these changes to to git. So what I'm doing now is I'm saying right this is my website and I'm committing the initial version of it. And it's done all that and again if you're not understanding git just say just understand that what I've done now is I've taken the current state of my website and I've added it in or my documentation website and I've added it into a version control repository which I can then so I can push all that content to the cloud in a controlled manner and if I look at this if I look at the status of, of my working environment it's clean right now we have to go onto our public cloud service and create a project which we could use to publish this so I'm using GitLab and I'm going to call my project demo docs project because uh, I'm not very imaginative. And you can create a you can create a free account on GitLab. It will work tickety boo. Oh, right place. So here I'm on GitLab. I'm signed in. You can create you can create your own free account. Um, and I want me to create a new project. So if I go into projects, create a blank project. And I'm going to give it the name that I want to give it. It's existing underneath my account. Um, and I can just give it a description. I'm going to make it private, which means that you won't be able to see it unless until I make it public. Um, and the great thing about GitLab compared to Git, so GitHub has similar features, but with GitHub, you can't create private websites. You have to pay for that. So now I've created that project. I can actually connect the repository on my laptop to the project that I've created uh, on GitLab. And you do that by just typing these commands so for this one command. So that's now created a link between what's on the what's what's on the public cloud and what's on my laptop. And now having created that link, I can now take that content that I committed earlier and I can push it to the cloud. Doesn't take very long. That was pushing my luck actually, because at this point the cloud fails. Yeah. Oops. Right. So if I just open this up, up here is the project now with the with the content. Now it's got it, it's only uploaded files. It hasn't uploaded directories. All those, none of those empty directories came up uh, in the project that were created when we did the um, new project command, but or new site command rather. But that's fine. Uh, we, this is all we need to build our system. 
Um, so let me go back in here. Now, the thing we're missing now is a build script. So the, I talked about the CI or the continuous integration system. I actually need to, I actually need to create a build script so that, that CI understands how to create a Hugo environment and then deliver that Hugo content and then generate the content and deliver it into the pages system. So I do that by creating a file called .gitlab-ci.yaml. This is all going to be start becoming magic because the names of these files are important. The content is a bit is a bit different to what we're used to, uh, but it's actually doing exactly what we did before, uh, and it's quite easy. You know, if you just focus on that, it's doing the same thing. So the first thing it does is is it installs Hugo. That's the first thing we have to do. It's then installing a Hugo theme, which is what we did before. I'll come back to this bit later. But then we just run Hugo to generate the website assets. And then finally, it's preserving the public directory. So it's copying the public directory onto the, onto the GitLab web server. So again, all the things that we did on our laptop, we're doing here. Um, the only thing that we don't have to do here is create content because we push that content through Git into the cloud. So that's the missing piece. The only sort of additional magic of this line here, um, which is um, which is configuring uh, Hugo to understand that it's now not running on my laptop, it's running on the GitLab infrastructure, and that the URLs are slightly different. Um, and all you have to do, every, if you want to do what I'm doing, you just copy that page for beta, it will work on any GitLab um, generated website as is. So it's just a, a sort of last bit of GitLab magic. And I'll show you what it does in a minute uh, when, I, when I've got it running. That might be extra time. So we have to add that file in. We have to commit that file into version controls. And then we have to push that file up to the uh, GitLab system. And now, just by adding that one file, we should have a job running. So here we are running in the CI CD environment. It's installing GitHub for us. And it's already it's so fast, it's just it's just built the site. And I talked about this magic configuration setting here. What it's doing is just setting that base URL, which was blank in our laptop, in our test environment, but it's now set to what the um, what the project's uh, URL is going to be. And I didn't have to remember what that was. It just put it in here for me magically. So literally you just copy that, that one line in. You don't have to think about it. So the job ran, it was successful. Let's see if we actually got a website. Here's our website. Now, there's no theme change. Now, does that remember before I could click up here? And just that is because I was very careful to specify for production which versions of these tools I wanted. On my web, on my laptop, I was practically, I'll just take whatever the latest version is. But in production, you want to be a bit more careful about which versions you deploy. So I've deployed an older version of Geek Doc, which doesn't have the, the other problem that uh, I suddenly popped up and said, this is, this is not compatible, although it apparently is. Um, and so I specified an older version, which doesn't have that theming change or that, that look and feel change button up here. So that, that's quite important in the production environment to be able to control exactly what you're deploying. And the last thing is that these are private, you couldn't see them. But if I go back into my projects and go to settings, I can make it public. And in a few minutes time, you will be able to browse that content. It takes a couple of minutes to run the job. So if I go into guest into a unrecognized guest browser and hit that, it will hopefully lock me out because it hasn't got the oh, job's already gone through. 
So I have tested this, it, it does lock you out, um, but until but now it's public, so anybody can get in. Well, that's your lot. That's how to do it. Any questions? Thanks for demonstrating this, Alec. This is really cool. Like I've never seen a code-based presentation flow that smoothly before. It's a good audio. It took a bit of practice. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I, I located a rather nice little helper script that allows me to print out these lines before they run and things like that. Yeah, sure. I'm going to start using that more regularly from now on. Thank you. Um, yeah, if, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Got a question from Charlotte. She's asking, can other people add to your GitHub documentation? Uh, yes, they, my GitLab stuff, yes. So it's up now, I've just made it a public repository. Uh, and so it's available to anybody who wants to fork it and do the normal thing and they can push changes back and then that would, re and then once those changes are merged onto the main branch, it would result in an automatic deployment. So yes, is the answer. Excellent. The, the whole thing about docs as code is think like a developer. So developers can contribute to the code on GitLab. So can documentarians uh, contribute to content. Yeah, just a follow up question on that. Can you moderate their changes when, when other contributors have up? Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, Git, Git allows you to do that in all these cloud services. So basically people would have to submit what's called a, a, a merge request or a pull request, depending on which platform you're using. So they propose a bunch of changes and whoever's got the appropriate uh, authority can accept or reject those changes. They can review them and so on. What are the challenges people face when initially implementing this? From so from a dot reading perspective, none at all. Once you have a well-designed site, I'm trying to answer Darcy's question. Mm -hmm. So from, you know, once the site is published, then it's just a, an HTML website. So if you designed it correctly, you know, you've put your taxonomy in place, you've put your, put your um, you, you've architected the information properly. It's, it's exactly the same, it's just a website. Does that make sense? Did I ask a question? I'm not sure I really understood it. Yep, you did. Cool. If anyone's got any other questions, like I said, feel free to unmute yourself or type it in the comments. But um, if no one's got any questions, um, thank you for your time, Alec. Um, I will, okay, hang on. <laughs> so yeah, we've got a question. What costs are involved with this approach? Zero. Okay. It's using a, it's using open source software and it's using um, GitLab free accounts. So and, and the, why? So as I said, you can do exactly this on GitHub, mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to have a private website or private documentation website, you have to pay money. Whereas GitLab very kindly provide free private repositories with free private um, web you know websites attached. It's called GitLab Pages, so it allows you to have a website with each. Um, each repository or project. And, and as I said, same, same features exist on GitHub, but if they charge for privacy. Okay. And I will post the links to the notes uh, on Meetup. Excellent. Thank you for that, Alan. Has anyone got any other questions? Yeah, I do actually. I've just unmuted myself because it's faster than typing. Yep. Um, I'm actually just wondering, Alec, whether this would be something, a tool that you could use to create an API of, say, a JavaScript library and to have some interactivity within that. So to be able to test um, various functions within the actual API itself. Well, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, so next week we're going to, or sorry, next month we're going to talk about the Open API specification. 
And depending on which framework you use to, to render that documentation content, um, it does provide um, sort of API uh, testing type features. Okay, thank you. But that all happens on the browser side, not on the, well, not on the, so it's actually delivered as a bunch of JavaScript um, on the browser and then the browser starts hitting the API. Okay. Uh, hello, Alec. Hello, Alec. Hi, Daryl. Yeah, hi there. Uh, sorry, my video is not there, but I'm in a place where uh, where they don't like me to have the video on. Um, Alec, um, this is really a side question. Um, speaking of API, the Open API aspect, do you happen to know of good uh, tutorial uh, or or uh, introduction to it? So. I understand. I understand why you've asked that question. It, it, I found it quite quite a struggle. Um, worse than Hugo, in fact. Um, so well, I well, recently, as a matter of fact, the Smart Bear one isn't too bad. But uh, just I just thought I'd throw it out there. I know it's uh, I know it's a side issue to this to this okay, talk. Yeah, so so I quite like the one on the Open API website, um, oh. which I will. I, I thought that was quite good. But but you know your mileage may vary. Um, I'll just post it in the chat right now. All right. There you go. Um, so that's the one I, because of my te team developers I work with are about to start creating open API docs for the first time. So I've pointed them at this, but yeah, it's, it can, it can be quite confusing. And the tool, uh, the tooling is really confusing, which I will, I'll talk about the tooling next month. Uh, next, Look forward but, to that. But next month, I, next month I won't be able to more, more than sort of gloss over the, the sort of the content of the open API spec because it's really quite complex, and that would be, like I said, probably a two-day workshop just to get you people up to speed. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And thanks for today too. My pleasure. Um, I will still post this stuff in the uh, meetup.com website but there's the there's the notes I wrote um, for the for the stuff I've just done in the chat excellent thanks Alex thanks for sharing those links um, are there any more questions? All right. I mean, Henry was really confused when I said then, you know, do, do reach out to me afterwards and I'm, I'm happy to sort of follow up. Yeah, sure. So there's another question which is coming. Um, does Hugo offer search feature? Uh, it's part of the theme. Uh, so I can't remember if I enabled it here. Yeah, there's a search button up there. So I don't, I don't even know. If, you have to wire it up. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how because I've never had much interest. But um, if I type mermaid, If you wire it up, it, it'll kind of work, but it depends on the theme. So a lot of the power of Hugo comes from the themes um, initially. So, so try different themes, they got different capabilities. Excellent, thank you. All right, looks like there's no more questions coming through. So thanks for your time, Alec. Um, and I will put on the link and dates for the next um, presentation somewhere mid June, I think around the same time, um, it'll be remote again. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>